Well, that song does a great job of summarizing what it is to live the Christian life. In light of everything God's given to us, how do we give him our heart, our soul, our mind, and everything that is in us? Imagine, though, imagine spending your whole life making God apple pie. And you get to the end of your life and you find out that he doesn't like apples. Wouldn't that be disappointing? Imagine thinking that your whole life is about how you're going to be rewarded and evaluated by accumulation. Only to find out at the end of your life, you're actually evaluated and rewarded based on your distribution. We are looking at some of the most challenging passages that Jesus has in the, in the book of Luke. In our series, Treasure Map, How to Be Rich Toward God. And that phrase, how to be rich toward God, is where we began three weeks ago. Where Jesus says, what I want more than anything for you is not to miss out on everything God has for you. I want you to be rich toward God. Now we built on that last week with another incredibly challenging passage where Jesus says, store up money bags for yourself in heaven that do not grow old. And in this series, we're looking at how to look at all of our finances, all of our life, and how to leverage that as stewards of God's resources to be rich toward God. And I hope you are praying about and thinking about ways in our world, ways in our community, ways in our city, that God may be prompting you to be rich toward God. We've also been talking about ways in which God has coordinated this series, which we began three years ago, with the work he's been doing in the last seven or eight months in our church, to one of the areas you might want to be rich toward God is here at Horizon. As we've been looking at raising $750,000, but we weren't sure exactly the details of what for eight months ago. But this summer, the elders heard as clearly as we've ever heard from God that besides buying the video equipment to do video services for online services and live stream, we also felt like God was saying, now I'm, I, we looked at three different places in the building to put this new space, that we were to double or triple the amount of equipping services we currently have, the one you're in, over the next three to five years, both on the weekend and during the weekdays. To have more people challenged, more people going through the Bible, more people praying, more people taking communion so that we can equip people more uh, fully and create space in our exploring services for those who are currently being equipped in the wrong service. And many of you have said, man, I'm praying about that. Many of you have said, hey, I want to come. I want to be part of that. We talked about the difference last week between giving, sort of the operational giving that went to the treasury in the day versus giving of alms, the above and beyond. God's prompting me to things beyond my regular giving, giving. And so I hope you're praying about that. And whether you, you know, feel like God's asking you to be part of the thing God's directing us as a church to do, and you want to do that as a lump sum, or you want to make a one-year pledge, or two-year pledge, or three-year pledges, the good news is there's no system. It's whatever God's prompting you to do. But we're at a unique time in history. And this passage and the scripture we've been wrestling with continues today. Jesus just keeps stacking on this idea that not all giving is the same. There is giving that is godly there's giving that is helpful but there's also giving that doesn't connect people to the kingdom and god's gonna say i want you to give in such a way that it connects people to their heavenly father in heaven and the the metaphor he's going to use in this passage today lots of metaphors but the main one is that god is going to come knocking on your door when god comes knocking on your door will you and i be ready More than that, he'll say, when God comes knocking on your door, will you and I be ready, giving, and able? Will we be ready, giving, and able when God comes knocking at our door? Will we? Comes directly out of this passage. When he comes, and he will come, and he knocks that they may open to him immediately. They've been waiting for him. Therefore, you also be ready for him knocking. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And the Lord said, Who then is faithful and wise in their stewardship, their managing of their life? When God comes knocking at your door, will you be ready, giving, and able? 
So we're going to look today at three words. This passage really divides out in almost three pieces. God develops the first one an awful lot. Jesus does. What does it mean to be a watcher? What does it mean to be a steward? And what does it mean to be a beneficiary of your heavenly father? So first, Jesus begins building on the, the parables he's taught so far by talking about what it means to live and give like a watcher. What does it mean for you and I to live our life and to give financially like a watcher? We're watching for the return. First, he says, what if, what if you were living and giving, watching for the groom? Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning and you yourself be like men who wait for their master. When he will return from the wedding, that he, when he comes and knocks, they will open to him immediately. So a couple words in here. First, notice how important it is that we wait and we watch. Your waist needs to be girded. So if a typical biblical wardrobe was a, a robe that went down to your ankles, it was hard to run in the rope. So if you want to be prepared for something, you would reach down and pull up your robe, pull up the backside and tuck it into your belt or the rope that might be around your waist that turned your robe into shorts. So now you could run. When the prodigal son came home, the father girded himself up, tucked it in so that he could run to the prodigal son. So girding yourself, which the passage, that word comes up a little bit later in the passage, It means we are prepared. We are getting ready. We are prepared for the return of the Father. We've put ourselves in order. We're in a right place to be part of what He is doing. That's what it means to be girded. And your lamp's burning. There's another parable Jesus talks about the virgins. There's ten virgins that are some prepared and had the, the lamps burning. Others weren't prepared for the return of the groom and they allowed it to go out. During the betrothal period in, in biblical times, the groom would come to propose. You know, maybe knock on the door, come in, uh, the, the families had talked together, and the official proposal, you are now engaged. And now that you were engaged to the groom, the groom would leave during the betrothal time, and he would go and prepare a place for you. And he would go and prepare this place, and it might be you know, your future farm, your future house, but he was building a place for you. Then the groom would come at an hour you didn't expect and a time you didn't know if you were the, the bride and knock on the door and say, it's ready, let's go. He might come at midnight, he might come at three in the morning, he might come someday, but you had to be ready during the betrothal time. So when your spouse and groom arrived and knocked on the door, you know, the lights were burning, the lamps were burning and you were like, ah, oh, I've been waiting for you. And he would whisk you off to the place he prepared for you. And so part of living like a watcher is living in preparation for the great wedding feast that's coming before us. And that is why what God has called each of us to do individually, what God has called us to do corporately, is to prepare for the wedding feast. Remember we mentioned that last week, that heaven is described as a royal wedding feast. And Jesus is the bride, is the groom, and the church is the bride. And he came and he knocked on our door and he proposed to us at the cross. And then he went away for a time to go and prepare a place for us. That he might return and knock on our door at an hour we do not expect and that we will be prepared. And while we're doing that, the church corporately, what we are called by God to do is to wash the bride in the word. That's one of the reasons we we felt so compelled in our vision to do two different services. Because part of preparing the bride is washing her in the word, to going through the Bible together, to understanding what it looks like to be prepared, to be blameless and pure, to understand the grace of God in our life. But also, to get as many people to the wedding as possible. That God wants his bride to not only be washed, but also he invites everyone So we're building a relationship with our friends. We're inviting them to our exploring service. We're building relationships with them. And that's what Horizon's all about. Getting as many people to that wedding feast as possible. Because that's what God's called us to do. To be prepared for the wedding. Now we're one week away from a wedding. My daughter gets married next week. Next Saturday. And so there's been a lot of preparation. We want as many people to be at the wedding. To enjoy the celebration of love and commitment and vows together to see their faith on display. It's a lot of preparation, and that's what you do. 
You steward your life for the wedding. We're in a series at our exploring service called The Really Wed Game, where we're describing the the challenges David had in dealing with his in-laws, Saul, a narcissist, and and how to navigate that. And as I said, challenging Bible teaching is, is one of our values, and transform lives is one of our values. It's been amazing to see how God works and challenges people through all of our environments. Last week, as I discussed the self-centeredness that blows up a marriage, I had several people come up after the 10 and 11, 10, said, you pray for me. Man, I have blown up my marriage. Can I meet with you? I had a chance to meet with somebody this week. Before we got into marriage issues, I said, well, before you can do the kind of stuff you need to do, you need the engine. Do you know what the main message of the Bible is about? The person's like, not really. And I got a chance to share the gospel. That there was a great groom who came and served us and gave himself for us, gave us attention, loved us, accepted us when we were at our worst. And as I began to describe the, the gospel, I said, this is what you need in your heart to do unto your spouse what God has already done unto you. And I said, oh my goodness, this makes so much sense. I've never heard this before. So many people have heard about religion, but they haven't heard the gospel. Which is why we need as a church to have evangelism and discipleship to prepare for the bride. I have another friend I've been building a relationship with for 15 years. He's been to our exploring service like mm, 10 times. If he showed up to this service, he'd be freaked out. Like, freaked out? Yeah, he'd be freaked out. He's still a little freaked out at our exploring service. He loves the music. He loves the application. But every time I talk about Jesus, God, or the Bible, which we do a lot... He's like, oh, I've got to filter that stuff out. But that's part of us recognizing where people are at their journey and preparing people for the bride. Now, Jesus builds from this groom metaphor now to a master metaphor. Still being a watcher, though. Blessed are those whose servants whom their master, when he comes, will find watching. Are you a watcher? Are you living and giving like a watcher? Assuredly, I say to you that he, the master who's returned from the wedding, will gird himself have them those who are watching those who are waiting those who's giving and living was in alignment with his kingdom and he will sit down with them to eat and come and serve them do you see what he's saying this groom this master we serve when he comes and finds your checkbooks and your calendars and your life in line with his kingdom he says whoa let's dine together well done And he, the groom and master, girds himself, gets down to serve us, to wash our feet, to prepare a meal for us. Because our Heavenly Father didn't come to be served, but to serve. And he can't wait to serve you and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And when we live and give as watchers and put his kingdom in place, we are representing the groom that we love so much, the spouse that we love so much. Now he says, but you better watch. The master may return at the second hour or the third watch. Which means he might come between 9 p.m. and midnight. That's the second watch. Or between midnight and 3 a.m., the third watch. You got to be ready. At any time, the groom will return, and he wants to find you and I faithful in our living and our giving. He wants to find us and bless us and serve us. Now, why does Jesus keep switching metaphors? Well, he switches again, and I'll explain the third one. When you live and give like a watcher, it might be because he's the groom, it might be because he's the master of the house, or it might be because he's a thief. Know this, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed the house to be broken into. Therefore, be ready, giving and able. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Jesus is such a genius teacher. He says, you know why you want to live and give in accordance to the kingdom? He gives you three reasons. Because God is like that boss that gave you your first break. And you were so thankful for that big break he or she gave you. That how did you want to live? How did you want to work there? You wanted to work to please your boss. You were motivated by a deep sense of responsibility. 
And that is one way you're motivated in a Christian life. I want to please my boss, my master, out of a deep sense of responsibility for everything he's given me. But we're also motivated out of love. He's my spouse. And because he did, he loved me, he first loved me, my motivation for Christian living, for, for living and giving, is out of deep love for the one who found me and rescued me and didn't give up on me. And now he switches to a thief metaphor to give us a third motivation. If love and responsibility doesn't do it, somebody is trying to steal your rewards. And if you spend your life investing in only the temporal, you are being ripped and stolen the rewards of the future. So if you're not motivated by responsibility and love, be at least motivated to avoid loss and tragedy. Jesus is such a genius. Three different metaphors for why we need to live and give like a watcher. God wants to increase your faith that the future is a lot longer than the present. Increase your faith that he is your provider in the midst of good and bad. That's his ultimate goal. Now, have you ever had something stolen? Do you remember that feeling when you found out whether it's your identity stolen or something in your house was stolen or somebody broke into something you cared about, that violating feeling? My wife and I were in Chicago. It was our first year of marriage. I know it's the first year of marriage because everywhere we went, we had to bring our wedding photos, right? And people had to watch at least the, the highlight reel of a six minute of our, of our wedding ceremony. So the night before, we been some friend's house. We brought the wedding videos. We brought our wedding album. And I happened to have put it on this backpack that I kept my personal Bible. I had lots of Bibles, but this is that Bible that for 10 years, I felt like God had whispered to me and spoke to me. I had notes in that Bible. I had words from God from that Bible in the most significant moments in my life. We came home that night late, parked in right downtown Chicago behind our apartment complex. We went up the next day with church. We got up, came downstairs, went out to our car. So we got to our car to head to church that day. The closer we got, I went, <gasps> glass everywhere. Somebody had broken into our car. Worse than that, they yanked out, destroyed the dash, and grabbed our radio. And we just felt violated and the loss and the, uh, the attack on your space. And why didn't anybody see this? And then it hit me. Something worse had happened. I looked into the back back seat and my backpack was gone. With all of our wedding photos and all of our wedding videos and my Bible that God had spoken to me through for 10 plus years. And I was angry. We didn't even go to church that day. We were so angry. Just couldn't believe it. Over the next few weeks, we tried to call the photographer and maybe get some of the pictures back. But it was in a certain order we'd put together and, and try to see if we could find copies of the video. And that Bible I knew I'd never see again. And I kept hearing God's voice nudge me to say, Chad, I'm going to restore your losses. Now, I... I've never heard that voice. Other times things have been stolen, but I heard that voice. And I said, Beth, I said, I don't know if this is what this is. Something I ate last night. God tells me he's going to restore our losses. Chad, you're, you can be overly optimistic. You can be over, not really a realist. He's not going to restore your losses. We're in downtown Chicago. Nobody knows who we are. No one's going to find us in the city. Well, that makes sense. Weeks go by. Months go by. And even though we'd gotten some of the, the photos back and restored a little bit of it, I still felt the sense that God was saying, I want you to trust me. Three months went by. A lot of students at Moody Bible Institute live just off campus at a marriage housing. And so some of the police, the Moody Vices, we call them, from our college, would make their way over to pick up some of the women to make sure that they got safely to school. One of them, three months later, said, oh, yeah, somebody at that apartment complex months away turned in a backpack it's been sitting in our office for two months somebody finally opened it and recognized you i went down to that desk that day and i picked up my backpack this is the original wedding photos that were stolen from me in 1994 i was married when i was 10 in case you didn't know <laughs> still has a little bit of the watermark from where it was out in the rain for a little bit and my wedding videos were in there. 
And that Bible that God spoke to me was in there. And I'm not saying this is a prescriptor for every other moment, but this was one of those moments in my life that God said, you know that violation you felt of the loss? How much confidence do you have? And the confidence I had that God cared about the little things, that God was my provider, that God would speak to me, that God would see something that was so important to us and valuable to us. And God wants the same thing for you and I. For us to see that there is eternal loss that occurs, but if you will put your confidence in God, He will restore the losses in this life, but He will also give greater, greater treasures in the future by how we live and give as watchers, so the thief does not take what is ours. I mean, just this last week, we've had so many ways that God is working. We have over a hundred men learning how to be better husbands, better men, better dads on Sunday nights and Mondays at our authentic manhood. More than that, we have fathers coming to that program with their sons, sometimes 30 and 50 year olds or 40 and 60 year olds, saying, let's learn how to build our relationship together. At least every two weeks, somebody comes up after one of our four services and says, hey, Chad, Chad, I learned more today in 30 minutes in that sermon than in my entire 30 year spiritual education growing up. And I think, what a tragedy. I appreciate the encouragement. Drew and I aren't really that great that 30 minutes should make up for 30 to 40 years of spiritual education, but it is a sign of the spiritual dryness that people hunger for God in the Bible, but it is so poorly taught and so poorly communicated, no one knows what it means and no one knows how to apply it. We want to be a place that every week, 30 minutes of the Bible, you learn more than most of your spiritual education. We want that to be the hallmark. And Horizon is so many stories that we hear every Wednesday that I can't go into detail because we so honor people's confidentiality here. So often I'm trying to tell stories of what God's doing, but I'm also trying to hide the facts because I'm trying to honor confidentiality. I mean, just this week we've heard stories of marriage renewals and people who, are, who are, had already put in the divorce papers but are open to maybe God speaking to them about potential reconciliation. These are regular stories we hear. Of what the word and grace does. But sometimes a couple goes public with that story. So I can share some of the details. We've had many, many baptisms this this summer. And there's so many powerful stories. If you haven't been to our Saturday baptisms. I thought I'd just give you a piece. Of just one of the ways. One of our values. Transform lives. Is happening in and around us at this time. Let's watch. A year and a half ago. I was on a just a bad path. And my marriage was in jeopardy. Um, I, I would venture to say my life was in jeopardy. And due to a very serious realignment of everything, but most importantly my faith, um, I, I, I'm in a much better place now. And I was able to realign, uh, to put Christ in the middle. And it saved my marriage, and it saved my professional and personal lives. And these guys, in addition to many, many others, were by my side. And they never wavered, and they never turned their back, they never judged. And I knew that with these guys, but more importantly with Christ, I can get through anything. As Matt started to mention, our our marriage was really hanging in the balance and because of just, just sin and some selfish choices it was in jeopardy and I, uh, through just some different circumstances we decided that it would be best to just take some time apart and through that every, um, I didn't, we didn't know what the end would hold and although we were we're separated every night. I, I prayed it two nights that side. It didn't matter if it was two, three, four in the morning after I finished our project that I'm notorious for. But I chose to kneel down and just put this before the Lord at the foot of the cross. It's, I didn't know what the outcome would be, but I was trusting in Him that He would use this to His glory and this would be a part of our story. And Pray that he would continue to soften Matt's heart and draw him to him like the Bible verse, Ezekiel 6, 26 says, 
He would give him a new heart. It would have been softening his heart so open. I also knew that the Lord's ways are higher than my ways, and I was just trusting in that. And through that process, I would say the story that we've got to share is related to repentance and forgiveness and redemption. And that's really the story of the Lord where we can come and ask for forgiveness. I'm so thankful that Christ is now the center of our marriage, and that is something that we both are aligned on. So even though we know it won't be easy moving forward, there are always the ups and downs, but we have that foundation that won't waver. And through that, we've been restored. And again, there's so many stories every week I wish I could tell you, but I can't. Where God is working through the environments in our children's ministry and student ministry and adults and Bible studies and men coming around other men and women helping other women. We want to live like watchers that whatever time God comes, we're ready. We've been faithful. Which is why Jesus transitions from the watcher word to the word steward. It's hilarious, really, because he just finished this big challenging passage and Peter's like, hey, Lord, <laughs> do, do you speak into us? Or are you talking to the people out there? Because I hope it's for all them out there. I don't want to try and wrestle with this. <laughs> and Jesus is like, am, am I talking to you? No, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you and I'm talking to them. Whoever. He uses the word whoever several times. Who? Who then am I talking to? I'm talking to people who want to follow me. Who then is faithful? Who then is wise? And who is a steward? Whom his master, and again, that's why I think he's talking about followers of God. His master, somebody who belongs to his master. Let me tell you what my master says. If you want to be ready, here's how you be ready. Here's how you live and give like a watcher. You live and give like a steward. When the master returns, he wants to find people who are faithful. Faithfully executing the kingdom. Faithfully staying close and joining God in his endeavors. People who are wise, not foolish. In their stewardship, their management. God has given you resources. He's given you opportunities. He's given you the chance to be born. And of all places, 2018 time period in America, one of the most flourishing times in world history. He's entrusted you so much and he's asked, how will you steward the time you have in temporal space to leverage it for eternal space? And more than that, when you are faithful and when you are wise and when you are a good steward, oh my goodness, does he have reward? For those who live like a steward, he will make ruler over his household. He will give you a portion of food in due season. That in the future, there are ways that based on how you live now, how you steward your life now, there is great reward later. There is great reigning with him later. There is great ruling with him later. And not everyone gets that. Even those who get into heaven don't always get to rule. Don't always get to reign. Don't always get that portion He says, how you live now as a steward in this space is directly proportionate to how I utilize or use you in the future in future space. Here's how he says it. If you live and give like a steward, you're going to rule like a steward. Because if you can manage things in temporal space, why would I not want you to manage things in eternal space? That just makes sense. Blessed is the servant that his master will find, still yet in the future, doing the kingdom when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him, the one who is doing the kingdom work now, ruler, reigning over all that he has. When you live like a steward, you rule like a steward. But Jesus is such a genius motivator, he moves from the carrot to the stick. But if you do not live like a steward, even as a follower of Jesus, you'll be surprised at his return and you will be held accountable. Now, this is one of those passages, if we didn't teach verse by verse of the Bible, I would skip because it's so complicated and because it's so challenging. I read 10 uh, uh, commentaries on this, and nine of them didn't even address it. And it is a bear. I'll try and give you my best take on it, and I think I got a pretty good one. But if that servant says in his heart, my master, so I think he's still talking about what we might call Christians or God followers. He's not talking about a different category. So a Christian who's not faithful... Is says, oh, my master's delayed in his coming. He's not coming. Therefore, he doesn't live out. He doesn't live and give like a steward. He begins to beat the male and female servants. He doesn't treat people well around him. He begins to eat and drink and get drunk. 
He's controlled by things besides the spirit in this life. Then the master of that servant will come on a day. He's still coming. Even though he's not looking for him. He's not a watcher. And he's going to come at an hour when he's not aware. And here comes the challenging part. And the master who finds the person not watching and not stewarding will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. To which many people say, no, we're talking about a different category. We've got to be talking about people not going to heaven now, unbelievers. But Jesus doesn't introduce a new category. It's my servant, his master. So what could this mean? Well, there's several hints in the text. One of which is this term, cut him in two, is certainly hyperbole. When Jesus says, you know, pluck your eye out so it doesn't sin against you. He's not literally wanting you to carve your eye out. He's using hyperbole to say, go to whatever extreme. So he's certainly using hyperbole to describe the feeling of loss of rewards in the future. But also this phrase, to be cut in two, is also a Hebrew idiom. It would be like you and I say, oh my goodness, when I, when I saw what I'd done, when, when somebody called me on my behavior, I was cut to the quick. I was convicted of that. I was, oh, realized what I had done. Some commentators take this word to reference in Hebrews that the, the sword of God, the, the word of God is a, a two-edged sword that divides soul and spirit. That when the spirit comes, when God addresses this, it's going to cut us in two and we're going to realize we've lived duplicitous lives. We said we believed that our, our, our treasures were in heaven, but we live like our treasures were on earth. We said we believed he was our provider, but we live like we were our own provider. We said generosity was, was a high value, but we were more generous to ourselves than we were to God or his priorities. And when the groom comes, he's going to cut us in two and remind us we've lived duplicitous lives and there's a huge loss of eternal rewards and not reigning with him. Also notice it says he appoints him, not him with the unbelievers, but his portion. All the rewards God had for you, all of the treasures he had for you, all those get thrown out with the unbelievers. You missed it. Great loss. Great loss. But also the word unbelievers doesn't necessarily mean believers who didn't didn't believe that Jesus was their forgiver. You could just didn't believe he'd really come. Didn't believe he'd really reward. These could be Christians who believed in Jesus' forgiver but didn't believe he was actually going to come as rewarder. Either way... Oh, there's one more thing that the, the Greek translation here could actually not just mean unbelievers. It could be the unfaithful. That you will lose your portion just like all the other unfaithful people. Either way, the challenge is here. Jesus brings the carrot and the stick and says, you've been stewarded so much. Will you take the stewardship God's given you and leverage it for the kingdom? Which is why he transitions from steward into beneficiary. He builds on this again. He says, do you realize you're a beneficiary of of heavenly kingdoms? That servant who knew his father's will, you knew what the kingdom was about and did not prepare himself, didn't watch, nor did you do steward according to his will. You knew God's will, the will of the kingdom, but you didn't live the kingdom. You didn't live out the will of the kingdom. More than that, the book of Romans tells us you don't just know God's will, you're in God's will. You are a joint heir with Christ. You have treasures as, as a, a beneficiary of the will of God that you are already have access to. The heavenly places because you're joint heir with Christ. If you knew what, that you're in God's will and you saw this world as, as important but really funny money compared to the treasures that, that last forever, you would manage the funny money so differently compared to treasures that do not fail. You're in God's will. And since you're in God's will, do God's will. And here comes the carrot and stick. And if you don't, you're going to be beaten with many stripes. Which again, I think is a hyperbole metaphor for what it feels like to have that loss of rule and loss of reign. But he who did not know, oh, I didn't realize that I was supposed to live and give. I thought I just got to heaven and that was it. Yet committed these things. If you don't know, and even though you deserve stripes, he's even beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, much is expected. Here he's saying, if you don't know about it, God only holds you accountable to what you know. God's fair. But to those who've been given much, much will be required. In fact, every week as I get up to speak, I'm reminded in James... 
that those who teach the word of God will be held to a higher judgment. There's a great responsibility to be given much. And we in America in 2018 have been given much, much freedom, much resources, much opportunity, many, many Bibles that we don't open and we don't read, many, many resources that we don't invest in kingdom priorities. And we should have a deep sense of weight and holy awe toward if we've been given much, whew, much will be required. That's the stick. The carrot is put to whom much has been committed. It's because God trusts you. And when you live that out in the kingdom, when you do kingdom work, when you live as a beneficiary, whew, of him they will ask more. If you're reigning well now, I want you to reign more later. Let me put you in charge of bigger projects, eternal projects. That's what it is to live and give as a beneficiary. So, what are you going to do when God comes knocking at your door? Will you and I be ready, giving, and able? Right now, are you ready, giving, and able? I think there's three applications that come out of this text. Number one, pray to be ready. Pray that whatever hour he came, you wouldn't go, oh, quick, let's, let's, let me write a check. Oh, quick, let me, let me go uh, uh, apologize to somebody. Oh, quick, let me go start doing something. That you're already stewarding your life. That you wouldn't have to panic if God showed up. You say, yeah, I'm living out the kingdom. Two, give as you are able. I think this is why God, of all the ways he could have done financial giving, set up pro- percentage giving. So the more he blesses you with, the more you give. And every year you say, God, how can I give away more percentages of your money to your work? And that way, you give as you're able. If you have a little, you give a little. If you have a lot, you give a lot. That's the genius of stewardship and percentage giving that God put into place. The more he entrusts you with, the more he wants you to manage it for his priorities. But here's what's so important. That you can worship in everything. See, the Gnostics taught that there were, there were sacred things and non-sacred things. Bible study, good. Prayer, who God cares about prayer. That's a lot more spiritual than, say, fun or recreation or family. The Bible knows nothing of this division, that you worship in everything. Whatever you do in word or deed, you do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Which means every kingdom priority, though some giving is more important than those because it connects to the Heavenly Father, everything can be worship. Martin Luther one day was out planting some flowers and somebody said, would you be planting those flowers if you knew Jesus was coming today? He said, I sure would. This is how I'm worshiping God today. This is just as spiritual. And the way I manage my life, the way I manage my finances, I don't have to panic If Jesus showed up on my door, I would be delighted to show that I am taking care of the environment. This was my act of worship today. It's so freeing. God comes knocking at your door. It was last month. My son, 19 years old, had a birthday party. Asked me if I would go with him to Chicago to this late night, start at midnight concert with music and lights. If God had knocked on the door while I'm at midnight with my 19 year old son and Though we weren't doing it, my left shoulder was certainly had contact high from the smoke of marijuana here, and my back certainly was had contact high from the smoke here. If God had knocked on the door, would I have been embarrassed? No. Family's a priority. Your son turns 19, he asks you as a dad to come with to a concert, you say yes. That's a spiritual act of worship, family and marriage. God knocks on the door, and you're in the middle of a fight, and you choose to apologize. And receive the repair attempt from your spouse. That's a good time for God knock on the door. When you're giving mercy. And you're giving forgiveness. And you're giving love to one another. We want to be people who worship in everything. Does it include your finances? Without a doubt. But it includes your life. Live and give. Ready. Giving. Enable. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this challenging passage, a reminder again of what you're calling us to individually and also what you're calling to us as a church, to wrestle with our own finances, to wrestle with our own stewardship, and to make sure we're joining you in the great work you're doing here and around the world. 
We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being here today.